When you think of a next-generation warplane, you're probably going to picture one of a small subset of aircraft. Perhaps it's an advanced fifth-generation fighter aircraft, or even one of the sixth-generation planes that will soon take to the skies around the world. Perhaps it's a super-sophisticated drone operating with all the competency of a human pilot in places too dangerous for any person to go. Or perhaps it's something like Top Gun's Dark Star, planes that walk the line between aircraft and spaceship, pushing every limit of aviation while hiding under a heavy veil of secrecy. But one plane that you might probably have left out might be the most critical of all. That is the Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft. Big, slow, visually similar to a commercial aircraft and utterly incapable in a dogfight, these sorts of aircraft are critical for a different reason. They see everything. They know everything. They control the outcomes of not only individual battles, but modern wars. And in this element, there's one new plane that rules them all. The Boeing 737-AW&C, better known as the Wedgetail. Look, we said it before, we'll say it again. Airborne Early Warning and Control Planes, or AEWNC, are among the most underrated and underappreciated of all military aircraft. Their primary purpose, no matter who operates them or what plane we're talking about, is twofold. First, they are the planes that will detect aircraft, ships, vehicles, missiles, and other potential threats across a beyond visual range that extends way beyond the capabilities of any other plane in an air fleet. We're not talking about a radius here of dozens of kilometers, we're talking in the multiple hundreds, all within this aircraft's keen awareness. Second, they're designed to perform command and control in an air engagement, directing fighters, bombers, attack aircraft, reconnaissance planes, and any other craft that will join us in an air battle. In some ways, having a good AEW and C plane confers the opposite advantages as having a stealth fighter. With a stealth fighter, the enemy can't stop you if they see you. With an AW and C plane, the enemy can't stop you because you see them before they see you. These days, there are a few AEW and C planes that make up most of the world's combined fleet. Have you ever found yourself staring into an empty fridge and thinking, oh, what am I going to eat tonight? There's nothing in here. Well, say goodbye to that problem because I have the perfect solution for you, and that is Cook Unity. Cook Unity is not just another meal delivery service. It is a culinary experience brought to your doorstep. Imagine having award-winning chefs like incredible chef Chris Rattal creating mouth-watering dishes for you every week. That is Cook Unity. Now, let's talk about the feature that makes Cook Unity stand out. First of all, the chef. These are not just any chefs, they're culinary maestros from top restaurants across the US. Chris Rattel's got the grilled chipotle lime barbecue chicken with corn, black bean, and tomato salad. It is a flavor explosion, you will love it. And the best part, the meals arrive fresh, not frozen, in eco-friendly packaging with easy-to-follow heating instructions. Cook Unity offers an ever-changing menu with over 50 chefs creating dishes to suit every palate. From bibimbap to bolognese, they've got it all. Enjoy restaurant-quality meals for a fraction of the price. Subscriptions start as low as $11 a meal. Personal Personally, I love the flexibility because with Cook Unity, you could customize your meal plan, pause when needed, and choose from a range of dietary preferences. You could choose from 4 to 16 meals a week. So here's the deal. Go to cookunity.com slash mega50 or click the link in the description below and use my code mega50 to get 50% off your first order. It's incredible. Get ready for a culinary journey with Cook Unity. Your taste buds will thank you. Big shout out to them for sponsoring. And now back to today's video. The Russians use the Beriev A50. The Chinese use the KJ2000. Sweden, Brazil, Mexico, and Pakistan use the IRAI. India uses the Netra, and the US Navy, Israel, Japan, France, and Taiwan use the E-2 Hawkeye. But for several decades straight, the global leader in AEW and C has been the Boeing E3 Sentry. Now, we've already actually done a video all about the E3, so do check that out if you're interested, but suffice it to say that it's done very well in the arsenals of the US, the UK, France, and the combined forces of NATO. Equipped with a rotating radar dome, grafted onto the body of a Boeing 707, the world's air fleet of 68 E3s have performed very well over time. The only problem is, they're really bloody old, first introduced into service all the way back in 1977, that's nearly 50 years ago. And while that sort of advanced age is fine for some aircraft, the B-52 Stratofortress, for example, which can bomb America's modern enemies today roughly as competently as it bombs their grandparents, an AW and C plane is the sort of thing that you're going to want to update every once in a while. 
fail to do so for long enough and you'll start to look as if you're bringing a bit of a sword to a gunfight. And that's a problem that the United States was actually rather hesitant to solve, even despite the E3 making up most of its AEW and C capabilities through the 2020s. After all, not even America's defense budget is limitless, and it's a lot easier to get US Congress to fund an almost invisible jet that blows things up than to buy a new version of what looks to the uneducated eye like a commercial airliner wearing a top hat. But that didn't mean that Boeing was going to say no to a chance to build a next-generation AWNC plane, and this time they were going to get the lucrative defense contracts to do it without going through the US government. In this case, it was Australia who decided to sign on the dotted line, finally making good on an initiative to pick up a plane of this type. They'd nursed their dream since the mid-1980s and finally decided to pull the trigger in 1996 when the Australian Department of Defense decided to initiate Project Wedgetail. That name, by the way, doesn't refer to the somewhat wedge-shaped radar that eventually ended up on top of the new plane, but to the wedge-tailed eagle, Australia's largest bird of prey. Makes the name a bit more badass, if we're honest. The contract for the new plane went to Boeing. Probably not a surprising development when we consider that Boeing was really the only Western air manufacturer at the time that was equipped to make an all-new AWNC aircraft. Australia asked for four of the things with the potential to order up to seven, and Boeing decided to team up with two other major defense contractors, BAE Systems and Northrop Grumman. Together, the whole gang cobbled together the new Wedgetail plane, which took its first flight in 2004. Now, unfortunately, there were some bumps and bruises during the production process, which saw the plane's delivery delayed from 2006 to late 2009. And during these early years, Boeing missed out on other possible orders from Italy and the United Arab Emirates, which they might otherwise have gotten if production had moved on a little bit better. But eventually, the Wedgetail was completed, and on the 29th of November 2009, the first pair of Wedgetails were delivered to the Royal Australian Air Force. So by now, we understand how the Wedgetail came to be, and what role, in a general sense, it's meant to fulfill. What actually is it? On perhaps the most basic level, it's a modified Boeing 737 Next Generation, a twin-engine, narrow-bodied airliner that Boeing launched in 1993 as the third generation of its 737 program. The 737 itself is a highly competent airliner, with nearly 12,000 copies built around the world, of which the Next Generation line is by far the most common. But the plane was going to require some special bells and whistles if it was going to enter military service, and Boeing was happy to oblige. The wedge still flies at a cruising speed of 853 kilometers per hour, 530 miles per hour, and with a range of 6,500 kilometers or 4,000 miles, it's able to linger above a battlefield for the full duration of most combat missions. It's also capable of accepting refuelings via aerial boom, which in turn enables it to hang out in the sky for as long as it takes for a pair of CFM turbofan engines to crap out. However long that is, by the way, it appears to be a longer duration of time than a wedge tail has ever been asked to operate for in one go. Its external dimensions are those typical of a 737-700, 33.6 meters or 110 feet long, 12.5 meters or 41 feet tall, and a wingspan just a touch wider at 35.8 meters rather than 32.3 on the commercial version. As for why there's that little bit of extra wing, that's to compensate for a little bit of extra weight. And, well, why the extra weight? Well, that would be its Northrop Grumman-made multi-role electronically scanned array. This array, better known as MESA, is the central element of the wedge tail, and it features some serious capabilities. A long slender radar mounted atop the airplane rather than the round top hat featured on most aircraft of this type, the MESA is a gigantic radar, and it's capable of performing tasks that make it tremendously useful as a force multiplier in combat. The radar is able to track targets both in the air and at sea, as well as performing command and control operations over friendly fighter aircraft and scanning a provided area all simultaneously and all with a range of 600 kilometers. The radar is capable of tracking up to 180 targets at once, while coordinating intercepts on up to 24 of them with 360-degree coverage. And not only that, but the array is more than capable of collecting signals intelligence and intercepting transmissions as well, with a functional maximum range of over 850 kilometers when it's at altitude. These features, taken together, enable the aircraft to completely observe and control the battlefield without ever getting within range of enemy weapon systems. It's far better at tracking objects in real time than previous aircraft. It's got a highly effective friend or foe identification system at long range, and it's able to adapt and counteract when faced with electronic attacks and enemy jamming. All told, this Mesa system affords the Wedgetail complete awareness of a battle space, updating constantly and receiving and sending information via securely encrypted transmissions with friendly assets. 
It's highly mobile, more than able to work with US warplanes present and future, and it's built with 21st century warfare in mind, greatly increasing its operator's ability to respond to difficult conditions in combat and be a conduit between ground, air, and naval operations all across the world. Powering that operation, the plane's interior can feature anywhere from 6 to 12 operators based on current layouts, all working at terminals to attempt to process the incredible amount of information that this aircraft can take in. The rest of the aircraft is fitted with fins, counterweights, and a range of other features designed to offset the weight of the Mesa, and it comes equipped with additional space and seating to carry mission commanders and other decision makers who may use the aircraft to coordinate operations across a battle space or between multiple battles at once. When the Wedgetail first entered active service, it did so in the arsenals of three global militaries. Australia, where the plane reached operating capability in November 2012, South Korea, where it began carrying out missions in 2013 under the name PSI, and Turkey, where it was formally accepted in February of 2014 under the moniker Peace Eagle. With six planes to Australia, four to South Korea, and four to Turkey, the total fleet of 12 Wedgetails got to work. The Wedgetail's first operations in Australia came during the search for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. And on this mission, the Wedgetail obviously didn't serve a combat role, but it was instrumental in coordinating search efforts between ships and aircraft on the open sea. The Wedgetail was first on the scene when Australia began taking part in the coalition air war against the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, given the catchy name of Operation Okra within Australia. And during the first months of the air war, it carried out over a hundred sorties and logged well over a thousand hours of combat flight time. During those missions, a Wedgetail performed a 17-hour operational mission in November 2015, setting a new Australian record for operational duration for a single aircraft and accepting multiple refuelings in the process. Wedgetails would routinely perform sorties of 13 hours or more in Australian service, and during a rotation for one Wedgetail crew in 2016, that crew achieved 100% mission success over 36 missions, each of which took a minimum of 12 hours. Australian Wedgetails flew over Iraq and Syria through 2019, performing their missions with high competence and and retaining all airframes. One Australian Wedgetail is deployed internationally as we speak. It's flying above and around Ukraine in a six-month effort to ensure the safe transfer of supplies to Ukrainian forces. Turkish Wedgetails, or as we should say, Peace Eagles, have done similar work before and after the Australian deployment. And speaking of the Turkish version of the Wedgetail, the Peace Eagle has flown its own missions in support of Turkey's military efforts, although the nature of these operations is significantly more difficult to pinpoint. More likely than not, the Peace Eagle would have fulfilled at least some role during Turkey's operations against Kurdish forces, although since those Kurdish opposition groups don't have aircraft at their disposal, it's more likely that the Peace Eagle would have coordinated attack operations among Turkey's own warplanes while watching for surface-to-air missiles and other projectiles. In South Korea, the PSI, as it's called there, has taken part in joint military training exercises and presumably has taken part in the country's active air defense as it, as it maintains a constant standby to deal with potential aggression from North Korea. For several years after the Wedgetail entered service, it seemed as if this might be the extent of its deployment. A few planes each handed out to three nations in the Eastern Hemisphere that needed to coordinate air operations, but weren't about to be projecting power around the globe anytime soon. But that all changed in late 2018, when the British government revealed that it, too, was thinking of purchasing the Wedgetail based on how well it had served the Royal Australian Air Force. So confident were the British in the Wedgetail that they didn't even hold a competition before awarding a deal, something that royally pissed off Sweden's Saab company, but appeared to make the Ministry of Defence very happy. The UK expects to be able to operate the first of its three Wedgetails sometime this year, and might end up with five by the time all said and done. And where the United Kingdom went? The United States followed. Dealing with the realization that the century, which for so long had not been ideal but had at least been acceptable, was going to be badly in need of a replacement before too long and the US had nothing in the works, the US Air Force's announcement that it would acquire a fleet of Wedgetails spelled out that urgency, saying that the plane to be designated the E-7 in the United States, quote, is the only platform capable of meeting the requirements for the Department of Defense's tactical battle management, command and control, and moving target identification capabilities within the time frame needed. Put more directly, the US had dragged its feet on replacing the Sentry for a little bit too long, and now they very badly needed an alternative faster than it would take to produce a new alternative from scratch. In fact, so eager is the United States to get the E3 out of service that even today it intends to retire half the E3 fleet before any single replacement plane arrives. Luckily for the United States, Boeing had been continually updating the Wedgetail anyhow, and now, with their deep and rather intimate relationship with the Department of Defense, it would be no trouble to whip up a new Wedgetail fleet with all the extra additions that the US could think to ask for. 
The US was already confident in the Wedgetail's abilities, based on the ability of several of its allies to vouch for the plane, and crews were able to train on Australian versions of the craft well in advance of the Air Force even finalizing its order. In 2023, Boeing was awarded over a billion dollars to develop not one, but two variants of the aircraft that were meant exclusively to serve the United States. At present, the US expects to submit a production order for a total of 26 aircraft when it signs the paperwork in 2025, with the first American E-7 entering service two years later. That's enough E-7s to phase out the entire E-3 fleet and add an extra five planes for posterity's sake. Whether it'll still be called the Wedgetail, we don't know, but for our money, it's a pretty cool name. And almost exactly two decades after the Wedgetail first flew, it continues to proliferate around the world to a growing list of prospective customers. NATO has announced that it intends to acquire six Wedgetails, beating up competing offers from Northrop Grumman and Saab. Whether those six will be the only six NATO acquires is yet unclear, but given that NATO originally stated it wanted 14 new AEW&C aircraft, that contract might get some follow-on additions pretty sharply. And Saudi Arabia has been in talks with the US Air Force to pick up some Wedgetails as well, even as it attempts to update its existing E-3 fleet of six aircraft. With more and more nations trying to get their hands on the wedge shell, it's worth at least giving a little bit of thought to what the future for this highly esteemed plane is going to look like. The world is not a quiet place by any means, and even as we speak, the nations who have or would like to acquire a wedge tail are conducting operations in the Red Sea, watching battlegrounds in Israel and Ukraine, waging war in Yemen, engaging in a decades-long staring contest with North Korea, hammering Kurdish forces in the Middle East, and looking to counterbalance China's growing expansion of its power in East Asia. And while we certainly don't predict that World War III is going to break out anytime soon, it's worth noting that it'll be the Wedgetail flying command and control missions in the major conflicts of the decades to come. If ever the time comes for a truly global confrontation, like the ones widely believed to be brewing between the US with its East Asian allies and China between Israel and the broader Arab world and between Russia and NATO, then it will be the Wedgetail that will make incredibly important tactical decisions in real time. It's no exaggeration to say that the command and control operations that take place on the Wedgetail might one day decide the course of history. And if that reality does come to pass, then those involved in the conflict who've got a Wedgetail at their disposal will be pretty thankful that they did.